Well, since it's 6.01, I think we should go ahead and begin. Thank you everyone for being here tonight um, for Ask a Physicist webinar. It's a new webinar series that we're doing in place of our normal Coffee Beyond seminar here at the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. Um, we are excited to see how this one goes and we're excited to have three additional webinars coming up as you can see on the screen. Our next one will be in September, the last Monday of the month at 6 p.m. again, and you can go on to beyond.asu.edu to go ahead and sign up for that one as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Paul Davies, who is the director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts and Science. He will be moderating tonight's discussion. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, Katie, and hello, everybody. This is a little bit experimental for us, so bear with us if there are technical glitches. Uh, we live in an era of fake news, virtual reality, and utterly convincing computer-generated movies. So it's hard to know what's real and what isn't. Well, maybe none of it's real. Maybe the whole universe is a fake. That's not a new idea. In the 17th century, the philosopher René Descartes wondered how we could ever know if a malicious demon was fooling our senses and creating for us what we would now call a simulation of reality. With the exponential growth in computer power, many AI scientists and contemporary philosophers are showing a renewed interest in the simulation argument. And to debate, to debate the merits of the simulation argument are two of my Beyond Center colleagues, Molik Parikh and Sarah Walker. Let me first introduce Molik, who will put the case in favor. Uh, he's a professor of theoretical physics here at ASU, and he works on quantum gravity. He's best known for having found an important correction to Stephen Hawking's formula for the evaporation of black holes. Did Stephen get it wrong? Uh, he once spent a weekend in Albert Einstein's house with a dog, two cats, a frog, and a snake. And with no further ado, I will hand you over to Molik Parikh to give the case in favor that we are living in a virtual or fake reality. Molik, over to you. Thank you, Paul. So welcome everybody to the Beyond webinar on uh, big questions. And today I'm gonna to try to tell you, uh, I wanna sort of plant a grain of doubt uh, about the nature of reality uh, and maybe convince you that the world is not what it seems, that we are in fact in a simulation. So uh, I'm going to, let me pull up my, uh, slide here. Um, okay, so, okay, so I'm going to try to share screen. Okay, can you see this? Um, you should be able to, are you, do you see the, I just want to make sure that everything, that it's yes. working correctly. Yep. Yeah, you should... slides on the side though. Did you want it full screen or? I want it to be in full screen here. Does, is that, is it, oh, I, let's see if I do play. Is that better? Much, perfect. Much better, all right, great. So <clears throat> are you living in a computer simulation? And I'll, uh, to, I'll start my question, my topic um, like this. There are really two questions. First of all, is it even possible? that we could be living in a computer simulation? And second, if so, if it is actually possible, is it likely? And um, in the interest of time, I'll probably only talk about the first one. Um, and then later on, maybe in the question and answer session, we can discuss a little bit about whether it's, uh, it's likely that we're in a computer simulation. So let's, let me begin. I'll, I'll start with where, with what Paul was referring to uh, in, uh, well, uh, in France, there was a philosopher um, called René Descartes, is also a mathematician. And he uh, sort of was wondering about the existence of reality and he finally, and, and about how he could know for sure that he himself existed. And he concluded that, uh, he said, cogito ergo sum, which is Latin for, I think, therefore I am. And uh, Descartes' idea was basically that the fact that he, could think was proof of his own existence. Well, not so fast, Rene. 
Um, what we know today is a little bit different. Rene Descartes' idea is, doesn't fit in very well with modern science. So uh, here's uh, Francis Crick. He's a co-discoverer of, of DNA along with uh, James Watson and Rosalind Franklin. And uh, he put forward what he called the astonishing hypothesis. And it goes like this. It says that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. So this is a very materialistic idea of the brain. It says that everything that you perceive, that you think, that you feel is really just electrical signals inside a, you know, uh, a, a few hundred grams of squishy matter in your head. Uh, and so if you could reproduce that somehow, then you would have uh, uh, some object that would have exactly the same feelings, thoughts uh, that you have. And we have some evidence for this. For example, we can stimulate the somatosensory cortex, that's a region in your brain, with a little electrode, and that might cause you to feel a little tingle in your foot, even though nobody's actually touching your foot. So, there's, so our perceptions of the world, if you were to sh close your eyes, you would actually feel your foot being touched, even though what was, what was only the only thing that was actually happening was that there'd be a little electrical impulse somewhere in your brain. And this is an am amazing idea because it says that really we can, re there, that, that if you believe this, you, you're really saying that consciousness is essentially something that we can uh, mimic with material, with, with electrical signals in a network, all right? Uh, and so if you could copy that network, then that would be an exact copy of you with you, all your thoughts, all your memories, and th that, that networked copy would really think that it's you. There would be no difference in their own self-consciousness. Of course, there's nothing that says that these networks have to be carbon-based. We could have them silicon-based. We could have them any, we could have any form of it. And this raises the idea that you could create a, a computer code in which there's this network of connections. Uh, and if that network mimicked the connections that are going on in your brain right now, then it would be exactly, equal. That, that simulation would really think it's human and it's you, okay? So I want to hammer that home because that re this is really the basis of this, that we can uh, mimic our brain on a computer and that computer would, that, that simulation on the computer would really think it's you. Okay, so how, is it really feasible? Well, let's look, do some, uh, let's look at some numbers. The number of neurons in the human brain, they're about 100 billion. And the number of synapses, which are the connections between neurons in the human brain, those are about 100 trillion. Okay, that might sound like a lot, but 100 trillion uh, connections, if, if, they're each, if each of them is just on or off, can be represented by a computer with about 10 terabytes of RAM. 10 terabytes of RAM, that's nothing. That's like a thousand MacBook, top of the line MacBook Pros that you can buy in a store. So we already have supercomputers that have much more capacity than that. This means that we currently have supercomputers that, ha that if we could program them, would ha already have the capacity to be conscious, not just conscious, conscious like humans, to, to have all your thoughts and memories. All right. So, um, well, um, the next question is, is it enough to just copy, make a copy of your brain? Is that enough to tell you that the world you're living, I mean, you could, you could, you could, uh, create a simulation like that, but that simulation might soon figure out that it's living in a fake world. And how so? Well, here's an example. Um, so this is of course from the matrix. That's impossible. And that's the point. If you do something that looks crazy, that looks impossible, you, the, the simulation uh, would figure out uh, that something's wrong with the world. 
uh, and might, might get clued in that really it's not the real world. This doesn't really live in the real world, but it's living in some kind of simulation in a computer world. So in order to really pull off the stunt of, of actually fooling us, you have to recreate not just the mind of the, uh, of the, um, of, of the people in the, of the simulations in it, but also all your external inputs that, will, that, will, that they will interact with. So in other words, you have to create a realistic world around them. Now, that realistic world, um, well, we already see when we watch movies, we see CGI, uh, and th those are already very realistic worlds. And to the, the amount of realism you need, it depends on how much that world is being probed by the simulation. Uh, so you don't, want to find, you don't want them to find out that it's all fake and that the world doesn't really exist, but it's just a pack of electrons, so to speak. All right, so how would we do that? Well, the, the simulations that you have to worry most about are the physicists, because the physicists are going to probe the world at a very, uh, at a very minute level. They might do experiments with it. They might do uh, particle physics experiments or, uh, or, or, or you know. Uh, and if those don't fit in with, with some laws, then they might think that, well, something's wrong. So you need, in order to pull off the illusion, you really need to recreate a world at, at a level at which any experiments that these simulations will do, these conscious simulations, will not reveal um, the, the falsity of the world. All right, so uh, can we do that? Well, yes, we can do that as well. Um, so, the num so the number of bits needed to describe all the matter in the universe is about 10 to the 88. Now that's a huge number of bits. Okay, it's 10 with 88 zeros. So if you really wanted to create a, a world that was absolutely indistinguishable from ours, you would have to have this much data. And this is a lot of data. This is so much information that you can't use ordinary hard drives. You would need to store this information in black holes. So now we're talking about a very advanced simulation, civilization that's using black holes as storage devices in their computers. And, are, uh, and are, they're, they've mastered quantum gravity and are readily able to uh, get information in and out of black holes. Uh, and if you were to put all this information in a black hole, the, uh, the, the black hole that you would need would be slightly bigger than the sun. Now, this is, would be a very, very realistic universe because this universe would really describe every particle in the, in the existing universe and would accurately describe its behavior. Uh, and so the simulation, even if a particle physicist, wouldn't be able to determine uh, that they're in a fake world. In reality, you can probably get away with less. You only need to create a, a world about them. And as soon as they, and, and the rest of the world can be fake and not very high resolution. But every time they go and poke around and probe some area, uh, to, to do experiments, you only need to fill in the details there. And you don't have to simultaneously fill in uh, all the details in, of, of, all, of what every atom in the universe is doing. But if you, but if you could do it this way, you would, uh, if, if you wanted to do that, you'd need a black hole bigger than the sun. Uh, if the physicists turn out to do quantum gravity, then you're in real trouble because uh, then you would need a computer that would accurately um, would accurately be able to uh, fool a physicist who's investigating quantum gravity. For that, you would need 10 to the 123 bits, uh, which is another 120, which is 123 zeros there, and that would be essentially the uh, a, a computer that big would be essentially the size of our current universe. Okay. So finally. Uh, let me say, who would be crazy enough to simulate entire worlds like this? And why would anybody want to make these giant fake worlds? Well, actually, we would. Um, we already uh, love to simulate worlds. Uh, we do that with our games. We have SimCity and, uh, and Grand Theft Auto and more. And, and more seriously, we also have flight simulators that pilots use 
that are extremely realistic to, uh, to train on before they're actually flying real planes. And so these worlds, these worlds are, uh, look very uh, good on a, on a computer, but they, but they could be even better. They could be so much better, for example, if the characters in the world were actually conscious. Uh, and there's nothing stopping us from actually doing that. And we, it would be so much more fun to interact with, with, uh, with a world, or with, with games in which the, the characters roaming around are, are actually aware of themselves. So we might have a lot of uh, fun doing that. Uh, and perhaps, so perhaps all of this is really a, a simulation done by somebody who's having a good time. All right, so finally, let me end here by uh, saying that there are also st strong counter arguments uh, and I'll hand off to Sarah Walker for those, but here's one. You know how I know we're not in the matrix? <laughs> how? If we were, the food would be better. <laughs> all right, that's all for me. Uh, take it up. Thank, thank you, thank you, Malik. Um, and uh, before before you uh, we hand over to Sarah, uh, Jaya Tapley has a question uh, that um, directly relates to what you were saying. Just to confirm that you're saying that the things we feel happen because of how our nerves processes in the nerves, and that's that's the standard explanation. Uh, yes. We, we will of course pick up uh, um, Q and A after Sarah, and I must explain to everybody that you uh, f must feel free to ask your questions, preferably related to the topic of discussion and not something else entirely, and no politics, please. Um, uh, send those, uh, uh, I don't know quite how, um, but uh, Katie, who's uh, running the show here, uh, will uh, uh, moderate them and send them on to me, and uh, we hope we'll have time to cover some of them. Uh, when Sarah has uh, delivered her bit. Yes, um, let, let me uh, just respond to uh, the question from Jaya Tapley. Who, uh, the question is, do, are the things we feel just because of our nerves? And the answer is yes. Um, there are examples in which there are people who have come back from war and they've, they've lost a limb. Uh, and, but nevertheless, the connections, the nerve endings from that limb are still present in the brain. From the limb that they've lost and if they if those nerve endings can be stimulated in the brain via electrodes then they would actually feel sensations in their missing limb and that's called a phantom limb sensation uh, so yes um, i can't resi resist interjecting and saying um well does that mean that bacteria don't have any feelings um and i'm sure they don't feel pain but I once uh, met somebody who said uh, he'd worked with bacteria long enough to understand that they have a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> so who knows what other physical processes might lead to feeling. But I think the, the point you're trying to make is that it is a physical process and whatever that process is, whether it's just nerves or nerves plus other stuff, we could in principle uh, recreate that uh, and create a simulation of, of a feeling or a sensation or a thought. Uh, but it's time to hand over to Sarah, who will uh, be in the role of skeptic here. Uh, and uh, I should say that Sarah Walker is Deputy Director of the Beyond Centre. She's a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and an expert on complex systems, and is basically interested in anything that's cool. And this is certainly a cool topic, so over yeah. to you, Sarah. Thanks. Can you guys see it full screen? Are we good? Can yes. You yeah. Great, thank you. Um, right, so um, so Molik already, you know, gotten in the matrix, and obviously there's a lot of folklore that we might be living in a simulation. And my best guess right now is that Molik is in fact living in a simulation by his background. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, but first, I just wanted to talk about sort of the pop culture of it, um, which uh, you know we have a tendency always to think that um, the best models of reality are sort of reflective of the time we're living in now. So in the 1800s, they thought the universe was a giant heat engine because the most advanced theories we had were um, related to thermodynamics. And now everybody thinks the universe is a computer because our most advanced technology is a computer. 
Um, and we're even nowadays, you know, trying to prepare our children for the next era of technology. So I was a little shocked um, when I was watching Mickey Mouse with my daughter. When I was watching Mickey Mouse when I was a kid, I don't remember there being any automated AI flying around um, <laughs> talking to all the characters in the show. But Mickey Mouse nowadays has this character called Toodles that is an all-knowing AI and does everything for Mickey. Um, also, um, you know, Moloch mentioned some of the video games. Um, some of the ones that um, he described actually are sort of closed world scenarios. Um, but one I've been particularly intrigued with is Minecraft, which is an open-ended uh, world. Um, and uh, this is actually an important point um, about what a simulated universe needs to be able to explain. And one property of the world as we know it is that it does appear to have this um, capacity for what we call open-ended evolution, which is that new things continually emerge in the world um, and potentially need explanation. And this is a part of biological evolution. So far, the only video game to really be able to do that um, is Minecraft, to my knowledge. Um, and part of the reason for that is because it really leverages the creativity of the user. So there's always this interaction with the user. So one question is, if our, our simulated reality is really having this open-ended quality, who's the user that's continually engaging with us to make sure that our simulation isn't getting boring? Um, or maybe our simulation actually is getting boring. Um, so a lot of us right now are interacting with a simulated reality. This is my research group. Um, I haven't seen any of these people in six months, for, so for all I know, they could be simulations right now. Um, I uh, had a joke um, from one of my colleagues that, um, Perhaps um, what really happened uh, in the last six months is that we ran out of RAM for running the simulation. That is our reality, and that's why we're all interacting on computers. Um, kind of a rough joke, but, um, but it is kind of interesting that we've been interfacing more and more through technology, suggesting that um, you know, some of these things might be um, part of uh, you know, simulation, and um, maybe we're just reinventing what the universe has already done. Um, and so, um, so there is sort of a long history of thinking in physics about the idea that all of reality really isn't um, made of matter or things, but it might stem from um, informational based principles or actually be based on a simulation. But part of the problem with some of these kinds of arguments and not necessarily um, the ones that come from the deep foundations of physics, um, but many of the arguments that you've probably heard is that they're really just kicking the can down the road. Um, and so one of the biggest problems that I have with trying to explain the reality we live in as a simulation is that ultimately it doesn't really explain much um, because it just basically says there's some other universe simulating our universe and therefore that explains everything about us, but we don't have access to that other universe. Um, and a lot of the assumptions that go into um, making that kind of argument also assume that the universe simulating our universe has similar laws of physics to our own. Um, and so unless you make that assumption, you can't really talk about the constraints on resources and the kind of things that Moloch was actually stating earlier. Um, and so, you know, the universe that's simulating ours may not have black holes and therefore they may not have any information storage capacity to actually simulate our universe like ours. Um, and so there's, there's just too many assumptions that go into these kind of arguments. Um, so when we ask the question, are we living in a simulation? I think it's a resounding no. Um, but nonetheless, um, there are some intriguing things about biology that suggests that some of this kind of hypothesis about simulation um, might be interesting to explore. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about that for a few minutes because I think probably many of you are familiar with the arguments in favor of simulation, the arguments against simulation, but not sort of a middle ground. Um, and so, um, so even though the universe is not a simulation, I'm going to suggest that maybe we are. Um, and what I mean by that is um, really thinking about what life is, it's really hard to pinpoint its key properties. Um, and these are just two quotes from some of my chemist colleagues that work on origins of life um, that really kind of get at the heart of the matter, um, which is that if we actually look at the chemical world, there seems to be sort of no room for life. Um, and so Andy Ellington, um, who's an RNA chemist, has gone so far as to say life does not exist. Uh, Jack Shostak, who works on making um, 
uh, protocells, so little cell-like structures with RNA, which is a genetic material inside them, um, and also as a Nobel laureate, is a little bit more moderate in his perspective, but has um, claimed that as one focuses experimentally on any of the defining features of life, the sharp boundary seems to blur, splitting into finer and finer subdivisions. Um, and so one of the arguments um, that um, Paul and I actually have proposed among other people um, is that really part of the problem in trying to define life is that we're missing entirely the software component. So if we're looking at the kind of perspective that Andy and Jack were proposing, it's that really life needs to be defined in chemistry and all the properties disappear when you look at the level of chemistry. Um, but if we think about what's happening in the origin of life process, um, we have DNA and RNA emerge eventually, which are information storage and propagation molecules and cells can perform error correction and the evolutionary process is one of accumulation of information. Um, and so you really can think about the transition from non-life to life as the emergence of software running on the hardware of chemistry and um, essentially animating matter in a lifelike way and giving rise to the kind of properties that we're really familiar with. So when we get all the way to civilizations and technology like we have today, software is everywhere. Um, you know, we're very familiar with the idea that we can copy code from our computer to another computer um, and also talk across long distances. Well, all of those kind of processes potentially the copying, the idea of communicating over long distances and all kinds of other things associated with the way we think about information probably arose in chemistry as part of the original life in a very different form than they exist today, but there's some underlying principles there that are very common. So when we're asking this what is life question, we can think about life as software. So this example on the left here is what's called the game of life, um, which is a computer code model um, for the emergence of complex structures that look very lifelike. And on the right, I show a cell, um, which is also a complex, but we would call living structure that emerged in our real universe. Now, the interesting thing in comparing the game of life and a real cell is that we know the underlying rules of reality at the base level, the level of atoms or elementary particles in our universe, or the level of grid cells in the game of life are very simple. Yet nonetheless, we see these complex phenomena emerging at higher scales, which is related to the software that's actually running. So my proposal is, no, we are not a simulation. The universe is not, but life is actually the software in reality. So indeed, we are simulations running in a hardware, but we don't want to kick that all the way down the curb and just say the entire thing's a simulation because that doesn't allow us any tractability to get answers to hard questions. Um, and just to add to that point, um, on the note of consciousness, I think, um, I didn't touch on it with my slides, but since Molik brought that up, I just wanted to respond to that point a little bit that we don't really have any evidence that computers can simulate consciousness, even in, if we assume the world that we live in is actually physical. Um, and I think so making some assumptions that consciousness can actually be simulated and doesn't require an interaction between matter and some kind of abstraction is a very big, um, step to be taking. Um, and in fact, we are aware of at least philosophical arguments against that in the form of philosophical zombies, which are entities that have all the properties of a conscious uh, agent, but are not conscious. Um, and there's a lot of stuff happening in the field of consciousness research now to demonstrate situations under which philosophical zombies can and cannot exist, including by our own Jake Hansen here at ASU. Um, and there is a lot of interesting stuff going on there about whether it can be simulated or not, but right now it seems that we need new theories of consciousness because their current ones are not passing the test. So um, with that, I'm gonna just wrap up and open for questions. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Normally we would be giving you a round of applause, but I don't think that works with Zoom. Uh, and the questions have been pouring in uh, as both of you have been speaking and uh, you know, I'm struggling with the technology here. Uh, to try and keep it all under control. But something you just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, Darren Dugan is asking, well, what about the hard problem of consciousness and the existence of qualia? I don't think you used the Q word. No, I didn't um, use the Q word. Of course, uh, this is a, a vexatious issue that uh, philosophers and scientists debate all the time. Yeah. Uh, just for the benefit of our long-suffering uh, viewers and uh, audience, uh, uh, qualia refer to the fact that uh, we 
in, in addition to being conscious, we have this sort of inner uh, sensation. When I look at red, uh, it looks completely different from when I look at blue. Uh, redness and blueness are, are different from each other and different from the sound of a bell or the feeling of water running through my fingers and so on. Um, and uh, a zombie, in the sense that I think Sarah was introducing it, would be uh, a, a being who would respond uh, in all ways in a r rational and logical manner. We would deduce they were conscious, but there'd be no one at home inside, no one actually having those subjective feelings or sensations. And so Darren wants to know, can we ever uh, simulate qualia? Um, so I have a couple of responses to that. So one thing is, um, you know, the hard problem of consciousness is about the fact that qualia are subjective. So there's something you experience from the inside and whether or not they're measurable from the outside is exactly why consciousness is a hard problem because we're asking, can we objectively measure what something, what a physical system is feeling on the inside? Um, and I'm not sure that the answer to that question is yes. And so what I think is more interesting about consciousness is, is asking questions about whether it would be possible to prove one system is conscious if another is conscious by doing some transformation on the properties of the system and showing there's a continuum. Um, and so what I mean by that is if I had a, you know, um, a, you know, person A and person B, and I could show that, you know, I could, I could gradually change the system from A to B and preserve some properties associated with what we thought were conscious experience, you might say that both had subjective experience. And there's a lot of debate about whether that would actually work or not and, and what the constraints on that would be. Um, but I'm actually, the, the real test of consciousness for me is whether subjective experience actually can influence the world. So if I have a thought in my mind and the thought can actually change the world around me in some meaningful way, then consciousness would be said to actually exist in, in some capacity that's objectively measurable. But I don't think that you could ever get at the subjective experience that someone's having personally. But no. I, I defer to Paul. Well. And I, I disagree strongly. I think um, the astonishing hypothesis, of course, it is a hypothesis, and um, but it says that it's, that it's not just about little simple things like if you, uh, about being poked by, uh, by, you know, feeling physical sensations. Even much more complicated things that are deeply personal, like memories and ambitions and love, are all ultimately represented in the brain through some sort of material. Uh, process and we have indications of that in cases where people have brain damage you know they have a they have a stroke or they have some injury and then suddenly their personality changes they lose a lot of their abilities to speak it's not just uh, so very uh, sophisticated and complicated um, uh, responses occur in turn in in, in response to just material physical injury uh, so all of that is suggesting to me that qualia and consciousness sure we don't know how to program them uh, and there, there are some very complicated, maybe higher level, uh, higher level processes, but that doesn't mean that they don't have an underlying material uh, basis. And I want to point out to uh, what Gary Kasparov, uh, the world champion um, chess player, said when he uh, played against uh, Deep Blue, the IBM supercomputer that Chris beat him. <clears throat> he said that at times he felt like he was playing an opponent of enormous creativity. Uh, and this was not just, this was just a program that was just running, uh, you know, running a software. I mean, it was just a computer running a software. And yet he attributed this very human uh, notion to it of creativity because the computer would play with, uh, with so, such great panache and, and, and uh, flair that people would think that this had to be a human play. Um, Okay. With respect to some of the other comments, uh, uh, co well, uh, should we, uh, how should we go about this? Should we respond? To well, we've got quite a lot of questions. Um, I would like to give everybody, uh, or at least most people, a chance. Um, uh, so could we uh, move on? I want to give a special welcome to Barbara Temple, uh, partly because she's a cousin of mine, and uh, we've never met in the real world, but we're now meeting in the virtual world. And she's asked a question, um, but I'm not sure I fully understand it, because she says, uh, that something you said reminds her of one of her questions. So, uh, Barbara, uh, could you could you actually clarify what uh, what it is you would like to ask, and then I'll uh, put it to uh, to uh, panelists here. Um, but we have a lot of other things. Um, 
uh, well, at least one person has said, I can assure you I am real. Uh, I think we all feel that. That's exactly what a simulation would say. <laughs> You're able to talk now. We did have a question um, uh, ahead of time uh, about uh, I isn't the simulation argument just the same as solipsism? Solipsism being the philosophy that I know I exist, as did Descartes. Um, I know I exist, but I have no idea whether the rest of you are, are real out there. You behave as if you're real, but that's just by analogy. Um, so solipsism and the simulation argument seem to go hand in hand. I've never understood why, if you believe in the simulation argument, you want to simulate more than one poor soul who would be uh, in this virtual world. Why would you have a whole Yes, I mean, they're, they're related because, of course, there's this question of, you know, how do I know that I'm not just dreaming and that uh, uh, everything I perceive is, is just in my own head. Um, but, but a simulation would allow us to, uh, and, and if, you, if all you were interested in was to fool, one, fool your one simulation, then you wouldn't need to recreate this complicated world. You just have to uh, simply, uh, you, well, there's a distinction between solipsism and, and these simulations because they have lots of characters who are all perceiving the same world. And perhaps you're interested in how they would respond in that. So maybe you, just like in Grand Theft Auto or some video game, you, you'd want them to all interact independently. That might be a motivation to create a simulation. So I think, I think there's the, the difference between them is not the observer, right? So of course, all of us are constructing a model of the world in our head. So in some sense, we're simulating the world around us. And if I was a solopsis, I think that the hypothesis would be that no one else exists and they're all a simulation inside my head. But the simulated universe is saying that the entire universe as a whole is simulated yes. and that it actually exists in some other universe. So I think those, those two hypotheses are different, but they might have the same observational evidence and be consistent with the fact that in order to interact with the world, we actually have to build a model of the world in our head, which means that we're simulating it, at least internally by being conscious. Okay, so um, as uh, let me interject. So, sorry, back to Barbara. I'm trying to interpret all these messages. Uh, Katie says that she's able to uh, to talk now. Does that mean we're going to hear Barbara via audio? I should mention that Barbara is thinking of coming uh, to study physics at ASU. Uh, after this little show, she might think we're a bunch of crackpots. <laughs> um, so, Katie, can you uh, can you advise me what we do, or is Barbara typing her question? Barbara, you're able to talk now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Another question I was asking earlier, back when you were talking about Mickey Mouse, you mentioned how he built his own simulation. Let's pretend that the simulation theory is true, though I do have my doubts. But just say it is. What if the image created is itself a simulation, which is created by another simulated world? Just how far back could this go if you presume it to be true? This could just be an infinite number of simulations creating each other, could it not? Yes. There's a, a famous paper by Nick Bostrom at Oxford uh, who argues that once a, a civilization has reached the capacity to create simulations that can create more simulations, um, then there would probably be so many simulations that the odds are that you're in a simulation. Uh, and uh, maybe there's a base reality somewhere and maybe there's a there's a there's sort of an endpoint who which hasn't yet evolved to create further simulations, uh, but all the ones in between uh, would be simulations. Uh, this uh, relates Malik a little bit to a question again we had earlier, and someone else has asked it: that uh, how do we know that the simulation is not itself, is, or the, the the simulation is within a simulation within a simulation, so nested simulations. Simulation. Um, there's a, a a bit of difference between the way I like to describe it is that fake worlds are much cheaper to make than real worlds. So the fakes would probably proliferate and outnumber the real ones. So an arbitrary observer is more likely to be found uh, to be living in a fake world than a real one. I think that's Bostrom's argument. Um, but now what about fakes within fakes within fakes? And I, uh, the technology is beyond me, but somewhere on my computer I have a slide which shows uh, this and says, will the real universe please stand up? Uh, and so does there even have to be a real universe? Does it have to be a basement reality or could it all be an infinite stack of simulations and that's all there is? Well, there should presumably be a resource constraint. 
though, and it makes a lot of assumptions about the underlying physics of the quote unquote real reality, if there is a base level. And if there is no base level, then I don't know how you do science. <laughs> but the base level could have completely different physics, as you, as you said. And, yeah, which I think is would, a real problem. In fact, um, physics, uh, theoretical physics often says that there could, the world could be a hologram in which the other dimension, the other, um, the, the base theory might not even live in the same number of dimensions and would be completely unconstrained by our, uh, our uh, constraints that mostly come from gravity. Um, but somebody was asking, how do, what is the likelihood? So the other topic I wanted to address was, what is the likelihood of us, be, so of us being in a simulation? And here, the, um, this is much less clear. Um, there are some arguments that say that if we could produce lots and lots of simulations, then the odds of, of not being a simulation are very small. Uh, but in reality, there's no real way to uh, attribute meaningful probabilities. So we just can't tell. Um, but I want to say one thing that in quantum mechanics, there's a, a famous principle called the totalitarian principle, uh, which was put, put forward by Murray Gelman, which says that anything that is not forbidden must is mandatory. So if it's not forbidden by the laws of physics to have uh, conscious simulations, then somewhere in the many worlds, they definitely exist. Uh, and so we can be sure that there is at least some, some world out there in the multiverse of many worlds in which there, is, uh, there are all sorts of infinite simulations uh, running. If they're, not, if they're not blocked, uh, prohibited by the laws of physics, which it doesn't seem that they are. So there's a question from Emily Linden saying, well, you know, why bother to uh, convince a simulation that it's a simulation? Because it's only a simulation. I think your argument is that a simulation is uh, every bit as good as the real thing and would be a thinking conscious being interested to know that it's a simulation. Because indeed, we might be. So, put words into your mouth, but would you agree with that? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. What is it? Well, the, the question is, it's a bit like the question of solipsism. Uh, you know, why bother to convince uh, your friends that uh, you're the only person who exists? Because if you're a solipsist, they don't exist anyway. And so if you think um, uh, everyone around you is just a simulation, uh, Emily wants to know why bother to uh, articulate the arguments you have that they are a simulation because uh, they're not really there. But I think the point you're trying to make is that a, simula a simulated being is every bit as real as what we have assumed that we are. I, I think if you, uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine what, the, what's goes, what the, uh, our creators, are, our programmers are thinking, but, but if, we, if we attribute the same kinds of um, uh, you know, motivations that we have, we might say that, well, why do we create simulations at all? It's sometimes we just might want to know how things turn out. Uh, and then we would have an interest in making the simulation as realistic as possible. So uh, in particular, um, the laws of physics can be different in different worlds. For example, uh, there, are, there are other universes possible in which the speed of light is more or less, or, or, or gravity is stronger or weaker. And uh, it would be perfectly normal for, uh, for uh, a creator to sort of uh, for a programmer to just sort of uh, try different simulations and try out different worlds uh, and I think that's actually the way that these this would be coded uh, it's it's nearly impossible to imagine that they would just program into our the situation they would just program the current uh, state of our brains into it it's more likely that such a universe would have to start with a big bang with some very simple laws of physics and then would evolve forward and they'd see what they would get. Uh, yeah. I think that that's probably the starting point and that is why we need, you know. But every the, simulation like that is invariably, especially if it leads to intelligent observers like us, gonna hit a boundary, right? Because when you have intelligence evolve in that simulation, it starts probing the context of its evolution and asking questions about the laws of physics of its universe. And then it starts being able to use knowledge of those laws 
to change the properties of the universe in some respects. So for example, we have knowledge of quantum mechanics, we can do new experiments we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so eventually they're gonna try to hit the bottom layer or run out of the, the boundaries of the conditions of the simulation as they were. So I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any possibility they, that if you have a simulation with intelligent observers in it, it's not eventually gonna hit the boundaries of its parameter space and understand that it's living in a box. I, I don't think that's uh, true. If you have a, uh, even if they could do quantum gravity in principle, you could have, a, a, because of what we learned about black holes, quantum gravity uh, systems have a finite number of, uh, of configurations. So finite, but absolutely enormous by our standards. Uh, so right. you're using an argument based on our laws of physics and you're not accounting for the fact that intelligent beings might also have knowledge and sufficient technology to control those, which is how you're explaining the simulation starting in the first place. No, no. I, I, let's say there's, a, uh, there, there's a, a, an intelligent being that can do whatever it wants because it has its own sure. laws of physics. But they create a world which obeys our laws of physics. Okay. Uh, and, but it's completely consistent with our laws of physics uh, and down to quantum gravity. Now, the observers that will materialize in that world, which, which could be us, would never discover that they're not living in a simulation, that they're uh, living in a simulation. Because, because their ultimate probes of that theory, which would be quantum gravity, would be self-consistent. They will never find any weaknesses in their, uh, in the, that, that would cause their universe to break down. We move on to another question, because uh, Nicholas Rudolph wants to know um, what, what benefit would there be in knowing that we're in a simulation. And I seem to remember about uh, 15 years ago when this argument uh, first became popular, people were concerned uh, that the simulating system, whatever that is, uh, would switch off the simulation if it figured uh, that, as we would say in Britain, that they were rumbled, um, that we had uh, figured out uh, there was a simulation. And, uh, and so that we would do well not to go too far down this path. Uh, so do you think there is a danger that, uh, that the, all the fun would be lost if we uh, were onto them or it, and uh, uh, it's just a matter of flicking a switch and it will all vanish, us and the world? I don't know. I don't know what the motive of the person, I, I doubt it's just to fool us. They're, they're probably more interested in creating a whole universe and we're just a little byproduct of that. Um, I suppose of all the things to worry about that's rather low down on my list of things that, that will get switched off, but it would be an existential threat. The, the other thing I wanted to raise, it's an argument due to John Barrow some years ago, uh, that how could we tell if this was a simulation? And of course, it's very wasteful in resources to simulate a whole, simulate a whole universe just for the likes of a few of us now, say. Um, for example, uh, I don't see the moon outside, I think, because it's on, on the other side of the earth, so no point in simulating it for me. Uh, you could save a lot on the uh, data processing by just simulating a, a small amount. So if what we're seeing is a sort of uh, truncated and approximated version of uh, what we think the universe is, uh, if, to put it metaphorically, if you turn around quickly, you might see the scenery wobbling. Uh, and so if we look very carefully, we might see glitches in the laws of physics and, uh, and, yes. and so yes. of course there are people who investigate that that's part of their research is to look to see how the laws of physics uh, changed at all or maybe the tiny little glitches occurring uh, and that might be an indicator that this is uh, you know, an approximate uh, it's a cheap a cheap job that's <laughs> right if, if, the pro, if our programmers were cutting corners because they had some uh, uh, resource constraints then then maybe we could uh, find out about that uh, and we might all only be interacting by Zoom. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> what do we face? Um, Maybe there's a, a, a question from Steve Ruff about why uh, why uh, you mentioned black holes is uh, for information storage. Of course, they store a lot of information, uh, and uh, he wonders why you raise that subject. Is is it uh, to hide that information from observers? But I, I think you were, you mentioned it. In no. uh, so, so, okay, so black hole is, a, uh, is, a, is the maximally uh, dense storage. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the object in the universe that can store the maximal amount of information. Now we think of, we like to think of black holes as something in which once it's gone inside, it can never come out. But according to 
uh, what uh, Stephen Hawking showed, uh, the information in a black hole can come out uh, and it's in, encoded in a very subtle way, but, but, it, but, it, but it's there. So um, if we, if we uh, were really masters of the universe and understood quantum gravity, then we would actually be able to use black holes as a storage device where we would store information in it and also be able to retrieve it. Uh, without that capacity, without that deep understanding of physics, the black hole would just be, we'd just be losing the information inside it. Um, but so, uh, so I have in mind that a very advanced civilization would, would be able to uh, actually use black holes as hard drives because they can actually um, retrieve the information with, from the Hawking radiation. I have a question for Sarah from Jaya Tapley. Um, uh, you, you were arguing, um, or at least saying, some people argue that life does not exist. And the question is, uh, wait, uh, how does life not exist? Uh, aren't we life? So does that mean we don't exist? So uh, how, do you, how do you answer I that? I think that's their argument. Um, so yeah, no, I, I don't agree with that viewpoint at all, obviously, which is one of the reasons that I'm interested in whether there's new principles that explain life, because I think um, when you reduce down just to the material components, um, all the properties that are associated with life are kind of lost. So there seems to be some additional properties that are necessary, which is one of the reasons for this appeal to information or some kind of information processing being potentially explanatory of what life is. But I think, I think your intuition is right. We should go based on what we think actually exists. Um, and I, I am also real. And I don't believe I'm a simulation, even though I know a simulation would say that. Although I do think parts of like, you know, we're, um, that explanatory principles for what I am will somehow involve information um, and information processing. Um, so uh, one additional point I'll say on that um, with the life does not exist part of it is that I think the way that we think about life is too binary in the sense that we think about things as being life or not life. Um, and or alive or not alive um, and it's probably much more a continuum of processes so part of the reason that you lose all these properties when you go down to chemistry is because they don't just spontaneously emerge when you bring the chemistry together there there's kind of a gradation of maybe more and more information being involved in the properties of that particular physical system and so a lot of the ways that we think about what life is is more about information and how it interacts with matter um, so the simulations interacting with the physical world like a real physical world, um, and that being the explanation for life, and that that's just an underlying principle of how our universe works. And life is sort of the structures that emerge from that kind of physics. Um, much the way that we get, uh, you know, planets coalescing or black holes forming because gravity works in our universe. Okay, now we're approaching the end of this uh, wonderful event, um, and we have just a few minutes left, and I thought uh, it might be a good idea if each of you could summarize the take home messages for the audience. Uh, and uh, if you've got any recommendations for further reading, further thoughts, uh, now will be a good time to give it. So, uh, Malik, do you want to go first? Uh, not really. <laughs> no, okay. So, not okay. Um, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, well, I, uh, I don't know about um, Reading, there's a there's a great paper by uh, Nick Bostrom, B O S T R O M, and uh, he's a philosopher at Oxford that really um, took this very seriously. And you can find his papers uh, online, and they're quite readable. And they basically argued that uh, we are following a simulation. Um, uh, but uh, my my the I guess the takeaway is that there's nothing. In, the, in even our existing laws of physics, even with uh, that, that we have here, that prevent us from creating very, very uh, powerful and accurate simulation that would, uh, in, in which the cre creatures we would simulate were conscious, were able to do physics, and yet would not be able to determine that they uh, lived in an artificial simulated universe. And that's just with our laws of physics. Uh, a, a, a creator that uh, was that came from some other universe that had its own laws of physics uh, would have, uh, you know, we don't have any clue about what kind of constraints they would be under, uh, and they would they could presumably do much more. So there's nothing preventing us from creating universes, and in a in a sense, with uh, from quantum mechanics, that's enough to guarantee 
that uh, there are at least some worlds in which simulated universes exist. Uh, but whether we're in that world, that's uh, still a mystery. Sarah, have you got any take home messages? Or yes, so this book recommendation is actually Paul's new book, which is The Demon and Machine oh. about, which is not oh. directly related to simulation, oh. argument, but a great summary of uh, physics of life um, and the information perspective on it. Um, and then, um, I, I, I mean, I actually am a big fan of Nick Bastian's work too. So I think, I think if you want to read any academic papers on it, he's got a lot of great stuff. Um, and I was going to suggest just for fun, uh, The Age of M, which is a science fiction book um, by Robin Hanson that explores sort of social hierarchies of AI competing for resources and things. So, um, but I was, uh, so as far as um, the arguments, um, I just have one final closing one, which is a little bit against what, um, you know, Molik was just proposing this idea that since with the laws of physics we know now, we could simulate everything in the universe, but they have, but those same laws of physics have no explanation for life or the origins of life. So actually, if we ran that simulation forward in time, there's no guarantee life would ever emerge in that simulated universe. Um, and I think that stands to reason itself that we don't know enough about what we're talking about to really say um, that all of reality is a simulation. So let's figure out what we are. Maybe. Now, uh, j just to throw in a recommendation of my own, uh, there certainly used to be a website called simulationargument.com. I suppose it's still out there. And that was uh, run by Nick Bostrom. So uh, I guess people could go there for further information. Um, but uh, before we uh, pull the plug and disappear from this virtual universe, I should mention that uh, this is the first event in our new series of Ask a Physicist, which, as Katie mentioned at the beginning, uh, replaces our uh, Coffee Beyond. Uh, we keep into the same day, that is the, the later time, which is more convenient for people uh, after work. So uh, the next event, which is going to be on September the 28th at six o'clock, um, is going to be discussing a very different topic. What is the origin of the arrow of time? Uh, that is the distinction between past and future. I think we all realize that the world, uh, the future is different from the past, but what is the origin of that? Uh, it's a, a deep uh, question of physics and philosophy. Uh, and um, the, the three of us are going to sort of rotate uh, so I'd like to take part as a panelist in that because uh, I wrote a book on the Arrow of Time many years ago. Uh, we'll decide who will moderate it, but uh, we hope uh, you, the audience, will join us uh, again. Uh, I apologize for any glitches that have occurred, but I think on the whole it's gone fairly smoothly. Thanks, of course, to Katie uh, and uh, Hannah, behind the scenes there somewhere, uh, who've been uh, helping out with the organization of this. I think we'll get better and better each time. Uh, and uh, to the audience, please do tell your friends and family and uh, uh, neighbours uh, and uh, they uh, need to go to the Beyond Centre website, that's uh, beyond.asu.edu, uh, to register for the next event. And I hope we can uh, see or this here from most of you uh, next time in one month from now. So it just remains for me to thank uh, our two uh, panellists who have uh, been wonderful in uh, playing the game and articulating the, the vision of these very difficult but fascinating topics. So that's uh, Sarah, Sarah Walker and Malik Parikh, and you'll be seeing them again in a month. So thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Great Bye -bye. to have you all.